What's up guys? Q&A 98, the big 100 is coming closer. This is the show where once a week, usually on a Wednesday, today's Thursday, uh, but usually once a week we answer some questions from the community, talk about various topics, whatever may be on your mind. And if you leave a comment below on this video, uh, I will be looking at these on the next episode uh, to see what people want to talk about. This one's going to be a little bit short because I'm kind of squeezing this in uh, along with the competition judging that is currently underway. Uh, so I've just got a, a small selection of questions and hopefully uh, we'll find something interesting there. There's also the problem that Daybreak only just came out really and people haven't got too much to ask me about that release just yet. But uh, let's see what we've got I suppose. I'll start us off with something that kind of blew my mind to remember. It's from Sean Scarlett who says, WP, did we ever find out what was dragged into the fissure in that little room at the top of the Massart Fortress in the Rising Flame story in season three? Or who was living in it? Yeah, so if you guys don't remember this, in uh, the episode Rising Flames, this was pretty early in season three, we go to the Fire Island chain, we go to an old abandoned Massart fortification uh, that has the region named Caliph's Steps. Uh, Caliph being a reference to one of the, uh, I guess, uh, leaders of the Massart that we know basically nothing about from the original game. One of the last bosses you fight right before you break through, or as you break through the Onyx Gate and get at the Door of Kamali and the Titans. So at Caliph's steps, we uh, sort of disguise ourselves. We bypass the Massart defenses that have been left over, despite the fact the Massart themselves aren't around. Go into this small room, and we're only then there for a brief moment. But while you're there... The, uh, there's some stuff you can interact with. It looks like someone had been camping there. And we hear, we see some signs that someone was dragged into the fissure, uh, below. And, and that's kind of it. But it seemed like it was hinting something. I, I remember when I first went in there, and I may have even talked about this in a video, that it seemed like maybe there could be an update and we'd get another instance in there or something. And now it's just sort of weird. And it's like, how will they ever go back to that? It really seems like we're moving away from the Fire Island chain. We're moving away from the Massart and so forth. So what exactly happened there? Was it a dwarf that got dragged away? There were some other hints and some speculation we did at the time. But uh, as to your question now, as we're many miles away in Alona, uh, no, we didn't really find anything explicit out about what was going on there or what the devs were hinting at. I wonder if this is one of the side stories they want to tell but is now no longer in scope. Uh, pretty curious. Because you'd expect at the time that they put that in, they knew we'd be going to... Uh, nightfall regions and they knew that season four would be so far away and so distant so I don't know maybe you guys have got some interesting little stories and things you remember about that but I'm all on empty really it's just something to look back and ponder at there were a lot of little things like that in season three now when I look at it and where the line is blurred between they're definitely setting up for something in the future or this is just a part of the patch that never ended up a thing in the end uh, is kind of funny to look at so there you have it and we have a similar question uh, to this coming up very soon. Next one, though, is from uh, Chazo2, Chazo2, La Chazo2, who says, WP, thanks for the video. Istan is, in my opinion, the best living world map ever released. It has a perfect balance of gathering, fun meta rotation, cool high ground spots for griffin flights, uh, and fantastic weapons. Living World Season 3 maps got released with a focus on Ascended Trinkets. Do you think that Living World Season 4 maps will focus on armor and weapons? I am highly skeptical about having each map add a new weapon set. It's rather unrealistic. But maybe the next map will introduce one or two Ascended Armor pieces and let us have full Ascended Armor at the end of the season? Question mark. I get the feeling that as you ask me this, it's because you don't have Ascended Armor and you want an easier way of getting it. Uh, I think that if I, if I read the devs at all through these AMAs and stuff, they seem like they're being very careful not to undermine the existence of Ascended Crafting. At the end of the day, if you're playing these patches and earning money, say from that meta, and you're also earning Imperial Fragments, Bloodstone Dust, and Dragonite Ore, if these are things that are just a part of your experience playing the game, you are working on Ascended Armor. And I would say that over time, you get enough money, you'll be able to pick it up. I'm not sure whether they'll explicitly add a buy pass for people in the same way that we see raids did with raid rewards and the legendary precursor armor and stuff or fractals do which are heavy ascended formats especially fractals obviously have for general open world story based pve is that a smart thing to do start allowing people to bypass the crafting aspects i don't know 
they might determine that it actually is and that it's good because it means that in a few months time when there's lots of episodes out but people miss them they can get gems off of people by you know making people buy them in a similar way to a lot of people buy a crack in the ice just for those trinkets but uh, I'm not sure that this is really the answer what you're kind of digging at is what I would consider one of the biggest problems with Guild Wars 2 right now I think it's got two main functional issues in terms of retaining its player base one is matters of communities guild content and reasons to form bonds with other people and communicate with other people uh, and I talked about that a lot right at the release of Path of Fire the other half of the story I actually think is uh, items, gear, and meaningful rewards. And Fashion Wars 2 goes a long way, and so this release added two full new weapon sets. The, one of them is really just like a slightly shinier version of the other, right? So let's just be conservative and say it's one full new weapon set. That's good! And maybe we can get that on the next release as well. But, you know, six more of those down the line. At some point, you're gonna find a way that you want your character to look. And then an alt to look. And then another alt. And then even various gear sets. And then you're going to think, okay, well, what else is there to go for? And then when there's legendary armor in the game and there's legend legendary weapons and so forth in the game where you want to show those anyway just because they have more prestige, I think that it undermines the value of adding new skin sets like this to releases, and that needs to be addressed somehow. General itemization and loot and things like that in Guild Wars has always struggled, and I think it still drags it down to this day. This is why I think it was a big missed opportunity when they didn't add like a proper mount saddle slot and items relating to mounts, similar to how we have items related to underwater water com uh, content with the aqua breathers and the tridents and stuff uh, if that had actually been well itemized and there were different rarities and things to go for I think they could have keyed into that with all these living world releases in a really meaningful way but they can't because they missed all those opportunities I think the next big saving grace for the game in terms of like fashion wars for people who aren't too into the experimenting or eventually find their look that they're satisfied with. I think the biggest uh, thing that could be on the horizon and the devs should look into is a build template system that also has cosmetic loadouts that you can tie to various regions of the world and stuff. And that suddenly means, wow, I want tons of skins to fill in all these different loadouts and stuff. And then that could be a really meaningful thing to go for in the game again. But uh, going for just throwing more ascended gear at the whole uh, reward system just to keep people going? I don't know. And I don't know whether they should do it for weapons or armor. Moving on, we've got SV Razor 33 who says, Hey WP, first of all, damn you put out some really amazing content these days. Thank you. I'm not really sure my content's changed at all. I think that generally speaking, the devs have just put out good releases and sort of I can leech off of that excitement. There you have it. Anyway, they say, uh, I can't help it, but I somehow feel that the story with E is somehow winding in on itself. I somewhat tie that person to the white mantle now that we're done with them. And considering that through the Path of Fire story and this episode story, no spoilers, we don't see any mention of E. It kind of feels like we're diverging from E, like he or she is not important anymore. What are your thoughts on the matter? So this is the question I kind of referred to a minute ago with our first question. This is another one of those things, isn't it? Where it's like, look, we're on freaking Istan now. He's an interesting character. And uh, to add to your comment here, the guys that made this release were the Lake Doric crew. And it was the Lake Doric release that gave us so much on E before and these like interesting Crichton investment and ties that they seem to have. And there was all of that with the dead bodies and stuff. Now we come to Istan. What do we have? Nothing really. And I guess that makes sense because here's kind of the problem I guess the writers have with E. It's that E is shown to be, uh, you know, a guy with fingers in many pies and very invested in the well-being of Tyria and so forth. But very much a Tyrian central centric character, right? We're talking about areas around Lion's Arch and the capital cities up there. We are so far away now and it's well established in the law that these regions of Elona have been cut off for a long time. That, you know, how can we then say that E has a lot to do uh, and is in the background of all the political events and stuff down here? Especially when things have gone so heavily wrong, right? Like, if we're going to set up the story, yeah, E is still relevant and E is around and you're going to learn about E when we get to the Isna Isles and all that stuff. There's all these questions of accountability that then come up that make E look kind of like a weak character because it's like, okay, you're supposed to be this political mastermind, you're pulling the strings and so on, and look what you let happen to Elona and Joker. You seem to have been very ineffectual here, don't you? So I don't know, I feel like maybe because this season is around a lot of Elonan regions, it kind of muscles E out of the picture. Even if the devs want to pay off on that mystery, even if they want it to become prominent and significant somehow, uh, does it really make sense while we're in a loader? Probably not on multiple levels. And so my view from that point is the devs can do one of two things. They can leave it and let it lie and make it feel a bit weird that they were teasing us about E for so long. And now it seems we're going to have a full season of Living World 
potentially, unless we do go back up to core tiering areas like the Blood Legion homelands we speculated at earlier in the week, we're going to have a long time in Alonian regions where there's just no payoff at all. Or they could try and brute force E in. And I don't know, if they're incredibly intelligent, maybe they can find a way to brute force E in, but that isn't what I would advise. I want the story to just be told as, or, as organically, realistically as they can, and not try to shoehorn things around. So if that means while we're in Alona, we don't get much on E, then while we're in Alona, we don't get much on E. It's kind of funny seeing how long the E mystery's gone on now. You know, the Deep Sea Dragon is the other big one, I would say, that has been hidden in a big mystery and a big facet of the story for a long time, while being purely existent as a mystery. And E is, you know, it's even given that a run for its money now. I also learned very recently from uh, one of you guys in the comments that uh, there's a hint in one of the Path of Fire cutscenes that we might even see something relating to the Deep Sea Dragon. So I can't wait to talk to you guys about that. But I guess that's a bit off topic. So yeah, uh, I don't think that it's E's not important, as you ask in the comment, just to round this out. I think he is important. I think this character will do something important in the end, and hopefully we'll get a good payoff to them. But are they important while we're in the region of Alona? I say no, and maybe that's okay. It just means a lot more weighing around. Here's a question on a topic that I saw so much online. I've been asked many times. In fact, probably even talked about it on a stream or two. But I'm going to do it here in the Q&A. Uh, Cheshire said, says, Hey, Wooden Potatoes, do you think we are still bound on our oath to the Shining Blade? Question mark. I mean, dot, 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 we died, full stop. So I think we are free now. Okay, I know people really geek out about this and really like this and have been pretty hyped by this. I personally don't see it. So a little bit of meta commentary that moves outside of Guild Wars. Uh, around the time that the Shining Blade Oath was going on, we were around the launch of a new season of Game of Thrones. And attempting to not spoil things for people, a big storyline in Game of Thrones, I think inspired a lot of commenters on the Guild Wars 2 scene. But the thing is, on the Game of Thrones side, the oath in question specifically said that it ended with death, okay? Like, that was kind of the- it was written into it. With the Shining Blade oath that we took, it had no such clause, you know, like, till death do we part with this oath. That's not there in Guild Wars. You can't just draw from the one franchise, and I'm not saying this is what everyone's done, but I think there's some roots there. You can't just draw from one and, and expect it to work here. If we actually look at the Shining Blade oath, it doesn't say that it ends should the subject die. I mean, you might think, well, it's dead, so the magic goes away. But who's to say that? We're just putting that on there based on our own logistics when it's a magical world that otherwise we have no other examples of such things happening. The oath, uh, while we're at it, also didn't state that it could only trigger once as well. Not that it's triggered at all so far, but just to remind people, this is the idea if we give up the Shining Blade secrets, even if they're pretty mundane secrets... Uh, we will die, so we're sort of beholden to the blade at this point, right? Um, it doesn't even say, you know, if we told those secrets and it kills us, and then, you know, we find our way back from the underworld, like in the Path of Fire story, it do even that d wouldn't necessarily get rid of the oath, because it doesn't say it's a one-time thing. It could just be clinging to our very, you know, spiritual essence forevermore until we find a different way to shed it. So, yeah, I'm not really on board with this. I think it's a bit of I think it's a cool idea because a lot of people really want an excuse to not think about that oath because so many people took issue with it, myself included. But I don't think this is actually a realistic get out of jail with it. Here's what I actually think. Given that that episode 6 feels so much like it was just a bonus thing, I think that that oath will just never come up again or be talked about again. Maybe it will and the devs will find a really smart way to get it off of us in response to the community reaction to it. But maybe that would also be a, a good way of doing it, which is just not talk about it, you know? And there you go. Uh, and then this way nobody feels, you know, totally slapped in the face as we did around the time of episode 6 coming out. Uh, I'll see whether someone has a contradiction for me in the comments. Maybe we do have an example somewhere in the Guild Wars universe of an oath, be a magical oath being taken that definitely did end after a first death. But I'm pretty sure that that hasn't happened. So yeah. Adrian Tanith says, randomly thought of the Keel versus Nashblade event for the new Fractal. 
uh, was wondering why they haven't done another thing like this again. It was a cool little thing that got people involved in having a choice of what could happen in the game. Maybe they could bring this up again as a current event. So what Adrian is talking about here, for those who maybe weren't playing way back then, was the Living World Season 1 format. When they were playing with the idea of a living world, how can they make this feel dynamic and emergent and constantly changing? How can they put that change in control of the community? Uh, one of their initiatives was the idea of like having a voting thing, where people could, in game, uh, cast items into one of two ballot boxes for Evan Nashblade or Ellen Keel as a uh, new counselor on the Lion's Arch Council. There were various perks associated with either choice, uh, ranging from waypoint fees to black lion chests and the development of a new fractal. Uh, there's a huge amount we can talk about with it and have in the past. Why haven't they done that again? I think my answer to this is just that we're not in Living World Season 1 or Living World as it was originally envisaged. Uh, the idea of how Guild Wars 2 would be updated as a game uh, was a really profound one and it could have been a huge innovation and shake up for the entire industry and MMOs. It could have been amazing. But at the end of the day, it was an experiment. This was one facet of that experiment that was fun for what it was, but we don't know internally how difficult it was to pull that off. And uh, when they went to the Season 2 and then expansions with Living World Bridges idea, uh, all of that kind of just fell to the wayside. They have had some small moments where they've given us the opportunity to direct the course of the game since. Like when Alliance Arch was uh, rebuilt to its most recent iteration, there were polls again which allowed us to name one of the POIs. I think it was the name of the monument or something, right? Uh, and they've done little things. Uh, and I suppose if you even broaden the lens a little bit further, you can look at the designer weapon contest that just finished. And they've got small ways of letting the uh, community influence the game like that. But this kind of large voting thing, I think that was really, uh, it, was, it was a cog and an experimental cog in the part of a much larger experimental system. None of which exists anymore. And we know that they've done a lot infrastructure-wise to be able to get a lot of content out into Guild Wars 2 and as frequently as they do. Uh, maybe something like this is, would just be such a spanner in the, in the works that it wouldn't work. So uh, there you have it. I think that that's the answer. I'm not saying we'll never see it. I very much get the impression that if the situation really called for it, the devs could probably get really excited and find a way to throw that out. But um, as a general standard feature, it never was a general standard feature. It was a one-off and uh, I don't know. I think it would be a rare occurrence, if anything. Next question here is from Keith Pang, who says, Are you satisfied with the excuse that the gods have given us in the personal story? Leaving Tyria, leaving the mists because the fight will change the geography of the world. I know that the gods versus Abaddon fight turned the ocean into a desert, but Balthazar isn't fully a god. The fight wouldn't be that hard, and most importantly, he's trying to destroy the world. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. It sounds like they don't care. Yeah, listen, if there's any really big thing that I'm quite upset about with the Path of Fire story, it's this. It's a mess, and it makes absolutely no sense. And unless they can pull it together with stories that we haven't heard yet relating to Lyssa and greater manipulations and stuff, everything we hear about the gods' motivations from Cormir there is just nonsense. You're right, Balthazar's not a full-powered god, which means that it wouldn't be so hard to fight him on Tyria, and at that, they just gloss over how they managed to take him out while he was in the mist and depower him in the mist in the first place. Like, these are extremely important things to talk about. And then that last thing you just mentioned as well, yeah, Balthazar's going to destroy the world, so yes, yeah, so what if you have to nuke a continent to take him out? At least you save the world in the process. You may have dried up an ocean and turned it into a desert before, but that's still better than everything becoming a fiery hellscape of death and doom and even worse than that absolute utter oblivion because magic itself has gone completely out of control and the systems aren't there to sustain it anymore and then there are other sides of it is like well, why did balthazar become such a moron that he thought that would be worth it you know we always saw he was a bit blood, blood uh, hungry for war and he was a bit bloodthirsty but was he that foolish was an honor and some nuance a part of him at the very least uh, so yeah, this stuff is just like, it's icky, I don't like thinking about it, and I think that you're very right to raise these questions. If they can find a way to weasel out of this messy little tangled knot by talking about Lyssa or whatever else, uh, then I will be really, really keen to see how they do it. Because right now, I'm not satisfied by it at all, I don't have an answer for you, except that the storytelling right now seems pretty bad there. You know, I thought I was done answering this question, but I'm gonna keep going. Another side of as well that I find really interesting is that thing of how the Crystal Desert 
became a desert because of the force of the battle. You know, the magical dueling of the gods exploded the sea and evaporated it. Even that, if you remember, that was new information that was constructed, architected for Path of Fire. Before Path of Fire came out, we were left to just wonder why that had happened and, you know, posture that maybe it's because Abaddon was the god of water and the oceans and, you know, with him, his, his role receding as he's imprisoned, maybe it, it sort of subtly dries up, which is the uh, interpretation that I actually kind of prefer. So the devs wrote into the franchise, and it's not a contradiction, they were welcome to do this, but they wrote into it that it was the force of this fight. And you can see why they did that. They did that to justify the motivation later from Cormir saying, oh no, it's too uh, too hard for us to fight, you know, as an excuse to get the gods out of the picture. So you can kind of see how, like, fakely constructed this was, and even at that, they still failed to make it really work. Uh, and that makes me very sad to see. As to your comment as well, you ask about what they leave the mists. Well, I don't think the idea of them leaving the mists is related to them uh, being scared of destroying Tyria with a fight against Balthazar. I think the suggestion is that they leave the mist to find another world in case Tyria goes to hell or whatever, and that's the idea. But uh, that specific point there, I think we will get a lot more tangible, well-written stuff on. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. Uh, last question is from Mocha TG. Yes, who uh, is kind of a representative of many people who says, can you please do a new video on the builds that you run? I'd like to know how you do what you do. For example, what it that thief build is that in the video? Yeah, uh, a lot of it. I'm always surprised by this because I don't have the impression of myself as much of a build crafter these days. Uh, I don't have my uh, an impression of myself as particularly understanding the skill system so much better than most other people. But it seems whenever I vaguely change what I'm doing in the videos just for funsies, I get a ton of people asking me, hey, how do I run this build? What, what do I do? It To me, it's just obvious. That's a pistol, pistol thief build you were looking at there. And you would go in the trait panel and you would select the traits that seem to work. Actually, it's a pistol, pistol, dead, dead eye build. Uh, and it's just like what's intuitive. There's like multiple different lines you can run. Uh, a version of that build actually appeared over on the World of Enders channel where he was talking about a gunslinging dead eye. Uh, but this is always surprising to me. So I feel like value videos like that wouldn't have much value because I'm just sort of teach teaching people to suck eggs. But I get so many people asking me this, I wonder. Maybe you guys can tell me, should I do build videos even on fairly arbitrary normal stuff? Just because people like to hear about what I'm doing? It is a fun build, uh, especially the idea of open world builds. Uh, there have been some community initiatives to teach people more about, but I think I may have some stuff to offer there as well. So I might. I might start talking about more build related stuff. They'd be pretty easy, comfortable things to do. And if it helps people, then hey, maybe that'll be fun. Uh, but there you go, guys. It's just I don't really consider myself much an authority on builds. I just sort of run what feels good. Uh, maybe teaching people a bit more about the skill system and stuff, though, would be nice for the community in a broader uh, perspective. We'll see what we think. Thanks, guys. There you go. That's the q and I'm going to get back to the competition entries. If you want to get involved in these videos, you've got two choices right now. One, you can leave any comment on any topic you like down below, and I will read those and select those. You may appear in the next video. Uh, or you can join me over on Patreon because the next q and I'm going to do is going to be a super Q&A where I give really long answers and I guarantee everyone a response which results in these big ass videos. Uh, and so anyone who's over on Patreon and supports me there, the super Q&A thread should be live right now. And uh, the more that do that, the merrier. It kind of helps me live my life and so on. So thanks, guys. I will see you next week for more good stuff and uh, particularly Path of Fire story recaps and so on. Hope you all have a great evening. I'll see you next time.